All right, hey everybody. Uh, so in this video, I'm gonna talk about, uh, as you can see in your, on your screen, the second industrial revolution. Uh, I'm also gonna talk about freedom in the Gilded Age, different definitions of freedom among capitalists, among workers, among reformers. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. And then I'm gonna talk about labor, uh, the great labor question. Um, uh, kind of towards the end of this, uh, the end of this lecture. Okay, starting with the second industrial revolution, um, let's start with this focus question. What factors combined to make the United States a mature industrial society after the Civil War? <clears throat> so uh, actually, before I talk about that, uh, dive into some details about that. Um, let me let me just kind of talk about what the point of a focus question is. So really the purpose of, um, so let me back up a little bit. So every um, section uh, that I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go through that I'm going to cover in my lectures um, today, again, it's the second industrial revolution is essentially second one, um, section one, freedom, different definitions of freedom in the Gilded Age is essentially second uh, section two, and then labor is basically section three. So for the different sections, I'm going to have um, different um, focus questions. And yeah, the point of the focus question is to help you guys, the students, um, basically find larger themes and structures to bring the historical, basically the things that I talk about in my lectures, the details, the historical evidence, the events, the examples, um, the nitty gritty um, uh, details, the ideas, just kind of everything I talk about to bring all that together and connect it to a thematic purpose, connect it to a specific question. I think with history in a lot of cases, um, whether it's a lecture in a college, you know, history course, um, a just a um, uh, an academic history book, even a popular uh, kind of uh, kind of history book. Uh, there's a tendency to sort of get lost in the details, <clears throat> um, and I think detail obviously details are important, right? You have to know uh, the details to a certain extent, right? Uh, there are facts that, that are important, but history is not just a bunch of facts, right? Um, it's it's about coming up with interpretations, um, tackling difficult questions. Uh, and I think when you frame particular sections of a lecture within the context of a certain question, that helps, um, hopefully helps the, you know, and helps the instructor, helps me um, decide which de details are more important, which details are, are less important, and helps me sort of figure out what to leave on the cutting room floor, what to maybe, you know, if, uh, mention in passing and what to, you know, really emphasize. And it lets you guys know, again, what are the more important details? What are the less important details? How do the different sort of facts and details and and stories and uh, and uh, different things that are, are discussed and, and brought to bear, how do they fit together, right? Um so, yeah, I think as we go through each portion of this lecture, uh, I think you want to, again, keep in mind how the information I talk about relates to this larger thematic question. What factors combine to make the United States a mature industrial society after the Civil War? There's different aspects of this question, right? There's, you know, what's a mature industrial society? What does that mean? What is just an industrial society? So I'll talk about that. Um, and what are the factors that made the United States a mature industrial society? What is what what is a second industrial revolution? Like, what does that mean? Um, what were the factors that contributed to the second industrial revolution? What were the effects of it? What were the the, the effects, uh, the consequences, both positive and negative, of this quote second industrial re uh, revolution in the late nineteenth century? Um, so yeah, I think it's a good idea uh, as we go, um, you know, as we go through the lecture, um, you know, again, write this question down. Um, and I think maybe you, uh, as you take notes, and I would suggest taking notes, um, notes of some kind, uh, mark areas of your notes um, to come back to later to think about, you know, uh, connections between uh, that specific area of the notes, that detail and, and this particular question. And then also as hopefully you review your notes later um, uh, to fill in your thoughts during the lecture or um, uh, as additional information comes up from other lectures or other readings. So again, as you review your notes later, maybe it's a good idea to write short phrases from the lecture uh, and readings that connect that, that particular information to each uh, focus question and or examples that work together um, to answer the focus question. Uh, so hopefully that, that sort of makes sense. Okay.
let's get into it. So uh, again, we're going to talk about the second industrial revolution, and we're going to talk about what factors combined to make the United States a mature industrial society after uh, the Civil War, the post, uh, the era called the postbellum United States. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, explosive, uh, the nature of the explosive economic growth of the late 19th century, and also uh, how the United States became a mature industrial society and what the particular manifestations and consequences uh, uh, were of that. Okay, so in the late 19th century, yeah, the United States experienced perhaps the fastest and most far-reaching economic revolution in history. Um, <clears throat> this was characterized by far uh, abundant natural resources, undergirded by abundant natural resources, uh, also a growing labor supply and market for manufactured goods, uh, and new capital for investments. Uh, investment, uh, all, all of these things fostered massive economic expansion. So the federal government uh, also spurred industrial and agricultural development uh, through different policies like enacting tariffs. By the way, a tariff um, uh, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. So they in, uh, in, uh, enacted tariffs protecting U.S. industries from foreign competition, partic particularly um, uh, manufacturing uh, industries, uh, domestic manufacturing from foreign competition. They also gave land grants to railroads. They used the army to remove Indians from Western lands. Um, that were um, sought out by, by farmers and mining companies, for example. Uh, every region, with the notable exception of the South, saw a rapid expansion of manufacturing, uh, mining, and railroad construction, ending an earlier America uh, uh, that was essentially made up of small farms and small artisan workshops. Um, I should mention that that era of small farms and artisan you know workshops um this sort of uh jeffersonian conception of like an empire of liberty of small yeoman farmers and and uh you know small uh you know craftsmen uh working in small you know uh shops and and uh small workshops that didn't suddenly go away in the late 19th century that had been eroding to a certain extent um, throughout the course of the 19th century, but it really accelerated in the late 19th century. And we'll see some, uh, we'll put some meat on, on those bones. We'll, we'll see some uh, examples of that. And uh, I'll help you guys to sort of, you know, contextualize and, and, and hopefully understand that. So by 1913, the United States produced a third of the world's industrial output. Um, half of all industrial workers labored in plants with more than 250 employees. Um, so the number of large industrial plants, manufacturing enterprises um, really uh, increased exponentially during this period. By, uh, by 1890, two thirds of Americans worked for wages, making dreams of economic independence like owning a farm uh, or owning a small workshop unattainable for most. Between 1870 and 1890, a new working class developed with a 11 million Americans moving from farm to city and 25 million immigrating from uh, overseas. Uh, most of them actually um, from Eastern, Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, some from East Asia as well. Um, so again, 25 million um, new immigrants uh, um, uh, during this time uh, as well, uh, you know, uh, populating these uh, uh manufacturing, for the most part, these manufacturing jobs in uh, the Northeast of the Midwest. Most new jobs were in industrial cities whose rapid growth was, be was best symbolized by New York City, a city whose banks and stock uh, stock exchanges finance railroads, mines, and factories, thus sponsoring industrialization uh, and westward expansion. Uh, the Great Lakes region was the center of industrialization during the late 19th century. Uh, by the way, the um, so really the center of industrialization uh, the, the earliest industrialization um, in the United States in the 19th century, uh, in the early uh, 19th century, I should say, was the Northeast. <clears throat> um, so places like Massachusetts, right? So the first manufacturing um, uh, major mo modern factory, major manufacturing enterprise <clears throat> was um, the Boston Manufacturing Company and the Waltham Wool System. Uh, and that was in Massachusetts, right? Uh you know, the Northeast. So uh, the Northeast was really the center of like the first industrial revolution, which was mostly a textile based uh, industrial revolution, again, located in the Northeast. Um, uh, and the second industrial revolution, the center of that um, in many ways is uh, is the Great Lakes region, places like uh, Chicago, 
Um, so the Great Lakes region was, yeah, the center of industrialization in the late 19th century with iron, steel, machinery, chemicals, and food production in large cities like, uh, I mentioned Chicago, also Pittsburgh, uh, and count, uh, countless smaller cities like Cleveland and St. Louis and uh, other uh, Midwestern cities. Uh, and during this time, the East uh, has a lot of manufacturing going on as well, uh, but becomes a center of finance, especially places like New York City, <clears throat> excuse me, Boston, Philadelphia, uh, uh, urban, uh, urban locales like that. Okay, continuing on. So uh, take a look. Hopefully you can see this, uh, this chart. So this kind of brings, um, <clears throat> uh, puts some meat on those bones, right? Uh, gives us, uh, uh, provides us with some quantitative numerical in, uh, information um, to kind of give us a better idea of what I was trying to uh, help us make sense of, you know, qualitatively, uh, descriptively. Okay, so um, it's not as simple uh, as saying, or you really can't accurately say that America went from a farming society to an industrial, man, you know, manufacturing um society of industrial workers. Uh, it's really, it's not that simple. And if you look at the very first uh, entry here under farms, that kind of explains why. The number of farms, um, let's see, yeah, the number of farms in 1870 was 2.7 million. In 1900, it was 5.7 million. In 1920, it was 6.4 uh, million. So the number of farms goes up, actually. The number of acreage goes up uh, as well. So it about doubles from 1870 to, to 1920. And so, it, again, it's not accurate to say that America was kind of disinvesting uh, in farms and um, proliferating its investment in manufacturing. That's not – there's like a – um, uh, an aspect of that, that that's accurate, but that's not totally accurate. That's not telling the whole story. Um, and in fact, uh, it's not, I, I would say, it's not accurate to put agricultural and, uh, agriculture, excuse me, in one category and um, industrialization in another category. Agricultural itself became, uh, the agricultural sector became more industrialized. Um, uh, agriculture um, uh, made use of more technologically sophisticated machinery uh, and probably most importantly made use of uh, greater distribution uh, capacities because of advances in uh, railroads, uh, which I'll, I'll get to in, in a second, which are a big, when you think of the Industrial Revolution and especially the second Industrial Revolution, which we're talking about right now, you have to talk about railroads. Um, so really agriculture and manufacturing are inextricably um, inextricably linked. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Uh, but again, the number of farms is actually going up. The number of acreage uh, is actually going up. But look at employment. <clears throat> so manu manufacturing employment goes from about 2.5 million people in 1870 uh, to 1900, about 6 million people, and then a little over 11 million in 1920. And look at percentage of the workforce. This is really where you could see this shift from agriculture to manufacturing. Um, even though agriculture is increasing in terms of the number of acreage, uh, the number of acres, you know, under um, uh, that, that are being being cultivated, actively cultivated by by small or medium or, or large, you know, agro business, uh, and also just the number of farms is is increasing. So look under per, uh, percentage of workforce, right? So at, uh, in 1870, uh, a little over 50% of people worked in agriculture, uh, either as, you know, just uh, um, uh, agriculture, uh, agricultural workers, or they own their own small farms or medium-sized farms or, or whatever. Um, then, uh, and during that time in 1870, uh, a little under 30% worked in industry, and that's defined as manufacturing, transportation, mining, and, con and construction, and then about 20% in sort of more, more um, what I would call like white collar professional class uh, industries. So they mentioned trade, service, administration, that kind of thing. So that was about 20%. By 1920, uh, you could see that's changed dramatically. So uh, only about 27% of people are employed in agriculture. Well, um, the number goes from a little under 30% to 44% employed in industry. Again, um, manufacturing, transportation, mining, construction. Um, so not everybody employed in industry is like working in a factory, quote unquote. Um, some people are working as miners, um, 
uh, within the context of mining operations, con you know, construction, constructing railroads, constructing uh, houses, commercial real estate, that kind of thing. Um, and let's see, the number of people employed in the trade service and, and, and administrative sector goes from 20 to 27 percent, uh, 18 from 1870 to 1920. So that gives you an idea. Uh, also, life expectancy, interestingly, in 1870 is 42, uh, about 42 years. That's pretty astonishing. In 1900, it goes up to 47 years. And in 1920, it goes up to 54 years. Uh, I'm going to talk in a second about how things for a particular subset of conditions for a particular subset of agricultural, uh, uh, sorry, of um, manufacturing workers, uh, industrial workers became more dangerous and how a lot of people were, you know, injured and, and maimed and, and even died on the job. Um, so you might think that life expectancy would go down, but overall life expectancy went up during this period. Um, uh, so that's interesting to kind of, uh, to kind of think about. Okay, so this is a painting called Forging the Shaft. So this is, was painted uh, in, in uh, the 1870s by John Ferguson Weir, and this depicts workers in a steel factory making a propeller shaft for an ocean liner. Uh, Weir, uh, in this, this painting, I would say, illustrates both the dramatic power of the factory at a time when the United States was overtaking European countries in manufacturing and the fact that industrial production um, still required during this time hard physical labor. So it wasn't just like pushing buttons, right? Uh, this was hard, physical, demanding <coughs> uh, labor. And quickly, this is a painting by Edward Morin uh, from 1886, which cap captures the excitement of the unveiling of the Statue of Liberty uh, in, in 1886. Okay, let's talk about railroads. When you talk about the Second Industrial Revolution, you have to talk about railroads. Yeah, so railroads really enabled, um, it's it's not uh, an exaggeration to say that railroads enabled the Second Industrial Revolution. Private investment and huge grants of land and money by uh, all levels of government, the federal government, state governments, local governments, effectively tripled the number of miles of rail between 1860 and 1880 in the United States, and, and then tripled it again um, from 1880 to 1920 over the next uh, 40 years. That's pretty astonishing if you if you think about it. Uh, this opened vast new areas to commercial farming and created a national market for manufactured goods. By the 1890s, five transcontinental railroad lines carried uh, products from the, the west to the east. Um, so they, they carried, for example, Western mine, uh, farm uh, products, ranch products, forest products to markets in the east, which, which in turn... Um, made factory goods, which were then sent back to the West, these finished goods that um, were the product of um, uh, primary, uh, you know, uh, natural resources and, um, you know, primary products from the West, extracted from the West, uh, were manufactured in the East and then sent to other places all over the world. Um, but uh, one of those places was back to the West, right? Um uh, which would purchase those manufactured goods, which would support the population, uh, the extractive industries of, of the West. So you have this economic system uh, being created um, between West and uh, being established between West and East during this time. Uh, time zones were created uh, really because of um, railroads. So by the 1890s, five transcontinental railroad lines, uh, sorry, uh, in 1883 is what I meant to say, the major companies, ma major railroad companies divided the nation into four time zones. And these are actually the time zones essentially that we still use today, Pacific time, Central time, uh, or what is it, Mountain time, Central time, and Eastern time. Um, the the uh, railroads did that for the convenience of railroad shipping. Um, uh, and that's lasted even uh, even today, right? Uh, so it wasn't politicians that really came up with that. It was ra the railroads. Um, it's interesting to uh, to think about that. Railroads were so critical to, econ uh, to economic growth in the national market that financial crisis on the rail rate, uh, the rail industry directly um, shocked the entire national economy. Um, so when the railway industry, uh, railroad industry, caught cold uh, or got sick, the whole economy. Uh, caught a cold, and that would result in recessions and terrible economic downturns and depressions, and people can be laid off. Um, so, expanding po and expanding population became an ever larger market for mass production, mass distribution, and mass marketing of goods, all of which are the basis um, 
uh, were the, the basis for this burgeoning uh, modern industrial economy that was being created in the late 19th century. National brands, national stores, and mail order firms such as Sears, uh, Roebuck, and Company emerged for the first time uh, during this time that serve rural communities across the United States as well. Okay, and this, um, I just kind of alluded to this, but this gives you an idea of, um, you could see this says, this is the railway network in the United States circa 1880. So very extensive railway network that was created even by the year 1880. And you could see the four time zones there. Um, so here's uh, Pacific time, mountain time, central time, and Eastern time that were created essentially by the rail, uh, railroads. And this uh, is another way to sort of <clears throat> contextualize this uh, and, and quantify this railroad boom. So the railroad mileage built from 1830 uh, to 1975 in the U.S. So you could see really the um, the most mileage, the most you know the most tracks were laid um, uh, over. It, you know, it's uh, not an exaggeration to say that the vast majority of tracks were laid. A disproportionate number of tracks were laid from about 1870 to about 1900, 1910, which is really the uh, mostly the period that we're talking about here. Uh, after about 1920, there's almost no new railroad tracks that are being laid, right? So that gives you an idea of the railroad boom that's undergirding the massive economic growth that's occurring during this period. Uh, and quickly, this is a... Um, a political cartoon titled The Greatest Department Store on Earth uh, from Puck, uh, which I, I believe was a magazine. Um, so this is from an issue of Puck in 1899, which depicts Uncle Sam selling goods, mostly manufactured products to the nations of the world. Um, uh, so the search for markets overseas would be a recurring theme of 20th century American foreign policy. Uh, and this is really and, you know, indicative of that and illustration of that. Let me just zoom in really quickly. So you could see all the different products that Uncle Sam is selling here. Uh, let's see, clothing, scientific instruments, chemicals, agricultural implements, um, and right here, provisions, machinery, steel rails. You could see just a railroad. Uncle Sam is holding the railroad, right? Uh, railroad is how um, the nations of the world are being delivered, uh, they're uh, getting access to these products, right? That America is selling. And and uh, you could see each of these men, it's a little bit hard to see, but their hats uh, bear the name of their you know country that they're representing. So here's Germany, England, France. Uh, back here is uh, Mexico, China. Um, and of course they're holding out uh, currency, uh, coins um, to you know buy these highly sought after products. Okay, next slide. So let's talk about innovation, uh, innovation and competition. Extraordinary technological innovations help quicken communications and economic expansion uh, in the late 19th century. So uh, chief among these innovations um, were, first of all, telegraph lines that crossed the Atlantic to Europe. Uh, the creation of the telephone. Uh, telephone was created during this time. Also the typewriter, the uh, handheld camera uh, began to be used. Both began to be used in the 1870s and 1880s. Behind many of these inventions, of course, was um, one of the greatest inventors of all time, Thomas Edison, uh, Thomas Edison, um, who uh, invent, who's known for inventing the phonograph, the light bulb, um, the motion picture camera. Um, uh, and, you, you know, you put all these inventions together and they really revolutionize private life, public entertainment and economic activity. Um, so you can't talk about economic growth and it's po both positives and negatives during this period without talking about these technological innovations uh, and their their impact. Um, you know, it was really far reaching and astonishing. Uh, Edison um, also could be credited with creating systems for distributing electric power. Uh, and soon entire cities had electricity for homes, for factories, for streetcars. Uh, electricity enabled industrial and urban growth. Um, because it provided a more dependable and useful source of power than did either water or steam power. Um, uh, and also newly invented, the, the uh, I should mention newly invented electric motor developed by Serb immigrant Nikola Tesla uh, effectively harnessed the power of this innovation uh, of electricity uh, that, um, you know, essentially displaced, you know, water power and steam power um, uh, so uh, basically Tesla's invention of the electric motor 
effectively harness the power of, of these innovations uh, and this particular innovation of electricity uh, for use uh, in industry and also for use in individual households. Um, economic growth was remarkable during this time, but also quite volatile. We're going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, with markets inundated by goods and federal monetary policy that remove money from the national economy and reduce prices, a series of se uh, severe economic recessions and depressions occurred, notably in the 1870s and also uh, the 1890s. Uh, businesses competed ruthlessly. So to stabilize prices and profits, railroads and other companies formed, quote, pools to divide markets and fi fix prices, and also trusts that allowed a single director to manage the affairs of several competing companies. Um, but the drive to compete often quickly disintegrated such schemes. Competition led some firms to control their entire industry by buying out the competition. Um, and this all led to a wave of mergers, really economic concentration that was unprecedented in, in scope and scale uh, from about 1897 to about 1904. Um, so this is the great merger uh, wave. Uh, and during this time, about 1897 to 1904, about 4,000 companies were incorporated into larger incorporations that served national markets and thus wielded immense power. Uh, and among these, you know, new mega corporations during this great merger wave, this great wave of unprecedented American economic consolidation, uh, you know, the new corporate behemoths were, you know, Standard Oil, International Harvester, U.S. Steel. Um, uh, U.S. Steel, by the way, was formed in 1901 out of uh, no less than eight large steel firms uh, by um, financer J.P. Morgan. So this is a picture of Thomas Edison's laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Okay, so with no personal or corporate income taxes, some businessmen accumulated massive wealth and economic power. One such, cap, quote, captain of industry was Andrew Carnegie, who you may have heard of. Uh, and so Carnegie immigrated from Scotland as a teenager and labored as a factory worker and tele, uh, telegraph operator, actually, before um, he used a position with the Pennsylvania Railroad to build the steel empire. During the 1870s depression, Carnegie built a, quote, vertic uh, vertically integrated steel company, and that basically refers to um, a, a company that controlled every stage of production from raw materials to transportation to mining to, dis to distribution, uh, etc. By the 1890s, Carnegie dominated the steel industry and amassed, uh, amassed a, a fortune of hundreds of, million of uh, millions of dollars. Um, for example, his steel factories in Homestead, Pennsylvania, were the most tech, uh, technologically advanced in the world, although Carnegie's upbringing instilled in him a commitment to democracy, social uh, equality, and he was you know, noted for being quite charitable. Uh, it's also important to understand that Carnegie um, ran his factories with ruthless efficiency. Um, so it's interesting uh, to juxtapose his ruthless business methods and sort of ethos with his, um, you know, penchants for um, generosity and, and charity. Um, uh, yeah. So more, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Uh, even more associated with great wealth, great uh, with extraordinary wealth, I would say, was um, John D. Rockefeller, who rose from being a merchant clerk to an oil industry titan in the late 19th century. Through cut uh, cutthroat competition, uh, he ruined rival oil companies, arranged deals with railroads, he uh, fixed prices and production. He also mastered um, uh, what's called horizontal integration, which refers to um, when one firm acquires competing firms. Um, which was what I just talked about with this great merger wave, um, what, what characterized this great merger consolidation wave uh, of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, so, yeah, basically uh, Rockefeller mastered uh, horizontal immigration, but soon uh, incorporated um, a vertically, uh, uh, sorry, incorporated a vertically integrated company, uh, essentially a monopoly that controlled drilling, refining, storage, uh, along with the distribution of oil. And we'll see a, a map of that in, in a second. By the 1880s, Rockefeller Standard Oil Company controlled about 90% uh, percent of America's oil industry. Um, such figures and their wealth 
of course, attracted the admiration of many Americans, but also the resentment um, of many Americans. It was, you know, was highly talked about. It was highly controversial, which we'll talk a lot about in in a few minutes here. Well, many rose from modest circumstances. Well, many of these um, uh, titans of industry, uh, so-called titans of industry um, or robber barons, rose from modest, uh, modest circumstances. Uh, their wealth and their methods for treating workers and conducting business uh, business alienated many Americans who thought their unregulated actions eroded political and economic freedom and damaged democracy. So again, uh, this is uh, men like Rockefeller and Carnegie and Jay Gould um, were highly talked about and highly controversial during this time. So it was really contested whether such figures, again, were captains of industry on the one hand or robber barons. On the other hand, uh, for example, in Wealth Against Commonwealth, um, his 1894 expose of Standard Oil's manipulation of markets and bribery of legislators, um, writer Henry Damaris Lloyd wrote that, quote, liberty and monopoly cannot live together, end quote. Okay, this is a picture or really a, a lithograph from 1876, which celebrates four of the major technological innovations of the century since American independence, the steamboat, the locomotive, the steam press, and the telegraph are all you know, depicted here. Here we go. This is a depiction of the electricity building at Chicago's World Fair at 1893. And the uh, electric lighting at the fair um, coming from this, quote, electricity building, um, uh, you know, is, is reported to have like astonished visitors uh, at, again, the Chicago's uh, World Fair of 1893 and really, you know, illustrates how electricity was changing the visual landscape during this time. OK, and this, uh, this is what I talked about a second ago. So this is uh, a representation or a map of. Uh, vertically, that kind of illustrates vertically integrated corporations. So it's a little confusing, but you can see basically um, the operations in red are the Carnegie Company. The operations, if you look at the bottom, operations in purple are American Steel and Wire Company of New Jersey. So if you look uh, here at Pittsburgh, um, look at the number of red, you know, dots or triangles. So I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I might have slightly miscounted, but you get the idea. Uh, those are all Carnegie operations. Some of them are like blast furnaces. Some of them are mills or steel plants or bridge building plants, but they're all Carnegie operations, right? That illustrates that's a vertically integrated corporation, essentially, you know, in a nutshell. Uh, American Steel and Wire Company of New Jersey it seemed to control a lot in Cleveland, right? Uh, if you look at all the purple dots and triangles, those are all from that one company, vertically integrated, <clears throat> again, illustrating <clears throat> essentially the vertically integrated corporation. And this is a um, essentially a political cartoon titled Workers Keeping Millionaires Afloat. And this is literally millionaires fat, you know, being depicted as fat cats like Jay Gould and uh, uh, Russell Gage and uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt uh, literally being supported by workers who are making, you know, it says linen workers average $11 a week, uh, lumber workers average $6 a week. So I think this political cartoon sort of speaks for uh, its, its perspective, kind of speaks for itself. Let's talk more about increasing inequality. During this time. So the benefits of economic expansion were distributed highly and evenly, uh, suffice it to say. So for some workers, it's important to point out um, some were some skilled workers had some control, uh, even in some cases, a lot of control over production processes. Uh, these were mostly certain kinds of miners and uh, iron, some, some, but not all, iron and steel workers um, who had more special had uh, obtained more specialized skills that weren't as easily replaceable, uh, more kind of marketable, you know, uh, remuneratively, remuneratively, excuse me, demanding um, skills that um, garnered them high wages, right? Um, so it's important to point out that some workers, you know, benefited from sort of that situation. And you could say in a sense, shared in the economic um, boom of the late 19th century, but most workers did not. I think it's it's uh, it's fair to say most industrial workers had um, semi skilled jobs or were essentially unskilled workers uh, that essentially their job um, was only managing a machine 
and, and it was uh, it was considered easily replaceable. Um, so these workers had essentially no control over the production process outside of a union, which we'll talk about in, in a second here, and were um, seen as being, you know, easily replaced uh, and dismissed whenever um, the need arose during a strike, during uh, especially an economic downturn, a recession, a depression, that kind of thing. Regular and prolonged unemployment became widespread for these workers, some of who became uh, known as, quote, tramps. Uh, which meant they took to roads and to railroads, uh, you know, on the open highway, on the open rails to other parts of the country looking for work during um, economic down periods, right? Uh, so though American workers earn more than their uh, European counterparts, it is important to point that out, um, American workers on average were um, higher paid, more highly paid. Uh, work was at the same time more dangerous in, in the United States, like I mentioned a few minutes ago. So between 1880 and 1900, an average of 35,000 workers died each year in factory and mining accidents. Uh, again, about 35,000 workers died in factory and mining accidents uh, each year because of the high unemployment and use, uh, because of high unemployment and use of public and private police uh, by capitalists. Uh, by industrialists, most strikes in America ultimately failed. Um, many workers were extremely poor and relied on their family to survive. They really had no had no other choice. Significantly, working conditions for the increasing number of uh, women workers uh, were especially deplorable. Um, so uh, women's working conditions were especially bad. For example, um, reporter Neil Cusack and others compared women's working lives to slavery. Um, Class divisions became more visible in this period as well, with the growing middle class uh, and also the excessive wealth of the upper class um, being more easily contrasted with um, uh, uh, striking more of a strike contrast with uh, this burgeoning, you know, proliferating class of poor wage earners. Um, you know, in mines and factories and, and that kind of thing. Uh, the rich began to retreat th to their own neighborhoods uh, and build fantastic mansions and estates in the cities and countryside. Uh, at the same time, a growing number of urban middle-class professionals, office workers and small businessmen uh, moved to their own neighborhoods and urban and suburban neighborhoods uh, and uh, use new streetcars and commuter railways to get to central business districts to, uh, to get to work basically every day. By 1890, uh, this is astonishing to say, but by uh, 1890, the richest 1% of Americans received the same total income as the bottom half of the population and owned more property than the remaining 99% of the population. So many wealthy Americans um, led you know, what can really only be described as like an aristocratic lifestyle. So you know, um, uh, America has long prided itself on being anti, there's a, a long history of anti-aristocracy. And really, America was founded, uh, the American Revolution, in many ways, was, you know, certainly anti-monarchy. Anti and what went hand in hand with that was um, uh, this idea of anti-aristocracy, right? So America has always thought of itself as a uh, place where stark class divisions um, uh, don't exist. We have more in common than we have, you know, differences. And certainly uh, your place in society shouldn't be <clears throat> um, uh, derived from your place of birth. Um, uh, shouldn't be synonymous with your your place of birth, right? Uh, class, class mobility. Um uh, we've America has always seen, it, seen itself as a, a highly mobile class in terms of uh, a highly mobile society, uh, right? In terms of classes is, is what I'm trying to say. And so you have this emerging arist really aristocracy uh, during this time, right? Uh, uh, this you know top one percent who um, uh, their lifestyle could be characterized as you know, uh, characterized by the consumption of luxury goods. They um, joined exclusive clubs and colleges and organized exclusive and attended exclusive social events, right? In dense cities such as New York, the urban poor resided in slums not far from the homes of the wealthy. Um, writers and historians offered, uh, offered um, stunning critiques of this contrast. So for example, um, Thorsten Veblen's uh, book called The Theory of the Leisure Class held that the rich... Um, you know, basically spent money, according to Veblen, um, solely to flaunt their wealth in an ostentatious, you know, display of conspicuous consumption, right? Uh, uh, 
which was highly aristocratic, right? Um, by contrast, Jacob Rees famously in, uh, in his book of photographs um, called How the Other Half Lives, presented a stunning array of photographs that documented the poor's wretched existence in New York City at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and we'll see a couple examples of that in a second. Yeah, so this is the music room of The Breakers, which is an opulent mansion um, owned by Cornelius Vanderbilt, um, in Newport, Rhode Island in the late 19th century. Uh, and this became a retreat for rich socialites of the Gilded Age. Uh, this is kind of the same thing, but on the West Coast. So this is called Palo Alto Spring. Uh, and this is a basically a portrait of upper-class life in Gilded Age America by Thomas uh, artist Thomas Hill. And this depicts the family and friends of railroad magnate Leland Stanford, who um, is the namesake of, of course, Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Uh, and this is everyone gathered at all of his friends and family, family uh, gathered at Stanford Farm in Palo Alto. Uh, um, and so that kind of gives you an idea of this, you know, aristocratic lifestyle led by some. And then this is a Jacob Rees photograph called ba Baxter Street Court from 1890. And this is one of the numerous photographs by yeah, Jacob Rees dep depicting living conditions in New York City slums. Um, most of the people depicted by Reese and New York City slums were new immigrants. So again, immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe who made their way to the United States for, um, you know, to work in, in factories, uh, in the New York, uh, in places like New York City and, and, and Boston and even in, in Midwest locales like, like, um, Pittsburgh and, and especially Chicago. And this is another Jacob Reese photograph called Prayer Time in, in, in the Nursery. Uh, and this offers, obviously, a, stri a striking contrast uh, to bleak homes in New York City, um, to the bleak homes of New York City's poor families, um, uh, depicted in many uh, of Jacob Reese's photographs. Okay, let's talk about freedom in the Gilded Age. Second section here. So we've reached uh, the second section of my lecture. So the question is, how did the economic development of the Gilded Age affect American freedom? Um, how do you define American freedom when uh, all of this is going on? Uh, this is going to change uh, conceptions of American freedom and uh, uh, and lead to arguments uh, over you know different conceptions of American freedom, which is what we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about. Okay, the period between 1870 and 1890 is the only time in American history described in a derogatory way uh, as the Gilded Age. I think I've mentioned that term uh, a couple of times so far in this lecture, but let's talk about that term in more detail. So uh, the term, quote, the Gilded Age uh, is um, uh, derived from the title of an 1873 novel co-authored by Mark Twain. And basically, Gilded refers to covered with a layer of gold. That's what it means, uh, which implies that the golden surface, um, this golden surface, deceptively obscures a core of little real value. So the Gilded Age thus refers to extraordinary economic growth. That's the the uh, gilded veneer, the golden veneer, right? Um, that we had certainly um, uh, that happened during this period, right? Um, but this golden veneer of economic growth and and wealth and opportunity and technological advancement that some were able to take advantage of was obscure, obscuring effectively. Um, the corruption caused by corporate domination of politics, as well as the oppression of others on uh, the competition for uh, for riches, bad working and living conditions, deplorable working and living conditions um, in the slums of New York City, for example. So as the nation industrialized, Americans tried to understand the ways in which their society was changing. Debates over political economy engaged millions of Americans, not just economists, politicians and academics who would normally discuss you know, matters of politics and economics and society. That's, by the way, what political economy means, right? Kind of the interplay of politics and economics and society. So normally academics and politicians, and especially economists, were um, uh, were engaging, uh, would engage in these debates, and they did during this period. We'll talk about some of them. But even ordinary people uh, were highly interested in, like, what the heck is going on with this new industrial industrialized capitalist highly urbanized, highly unequal, technologically advanced society. Uh, and what, how do we make this sort of work for us, right? What's the problem? 
uh, and what's the solution uh, to the problem is, is what people of all walks of life were, were debating. Um, let's see. Yeah, so people debated uh, the social consequence of, uh, consequences of industrialization uh, and even highly technical issues such as currency reform and land taxation, which we'll talk about. Many Americans believe that something was terribly wrong in the nation's social development. Uh, they talked about, quote, better classes. They talked about dangerous classes. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, you know, quite frequently, uh, a number of states and even Congress established committees to investigate the changing relations between labor and capital. Uh, and many were shocked to learn that employers and workers distrusted each other and that workers complained of abuse and poverty. So the emergence of a permanent class of wage earners, uh, what, what, a, what seemed to be a permanent class of wage earners during this time, uh, challenged traditional American ideas of freedom. So people really wondered, um, did America still offer opportunities to ordinary citizens to gain economic independence, um, which many people believe were, you know, was was um, uh, was what the nation had been founded on and uh, had, you know, this opportunity for all citizens or, or most citizens um, to gain economic independence, um, to achieve self-reliance. Uh, that that had undergirded American success to that um, to that point in time. And so with that sort of slip with that uh, opportunity for uh, those opportunities slipping away for so many people, um, how what was going to happen uh, to American society? Uh, were we ever going to get back to that? And and uh, how would we uh, how would America get back to that? Right. Um did America still uh, offer opportunity to ordinary citizens to gain economic independence, right? Um, so to many, uh, it seemed you know, increasingly that wage labor is no longer just a temporary condition on the way to economic autonomy. Uh, and also it seemed like the West, which was you know, initially seen as a refuge from the deprivation of the East. So if there's not land uh, opportunities for new uh, productive land in the East, you could just make your way West, um, uh, make your way to Kansas and, um, and uh, work your, your land in Kansas and through your blood, sweat, and tears, make something of yourself, right? Uh, that's what the West represented. Uh, there was real truth to that. And that seemed to be, um, that opportunity seemed to be slipping away during this time as well. Uh, many Americans saw the concentration of wealth in this period as natural. Uh, I should mention as, as well that many Americans saw the concentration of wealth in this period as natural and a sign of progress. Um, and mainstream economics actually held that wages were determined by supply and demand and should not be artificially changed by government or labor unions. The link between freedom and equality forged in the revolution and strengthened by the Civil War no longer seemed relevant. Uh, reformers in the liberal Republican movement, which challenged Grant in 18, uh, the 1872 elections, even argued, and this is really interesting, uh, they argued basically that universal male suffrage, uh, voting, <coughs> voting rights, was a mistake as the poor and workers might use the vote to threaten property. Uh, instead, they urged a return to property qualifications for voting. So... Uh, that's how bad things had gotten uh, was, you know, there was some talk of eroding um, uh, voting rights from, uh, you know, certainly you have women uh, who have limited or no voting rights during this time, African-Americans uh, uh, who have very limited uh, voting rights, despite being guaranteed voting rights under the U.S. Constitution, um, which is something uh, I think that's discussed in your, definitely that's discussed in your textbook. And I think I, uh, within the context of, of Reconstruction. Um, but there was some talk of taking away voting rights even from white men, right? During this time, and the idea is that the vote could be used as a cudgel, as a tool to, to um, uh, for the people with no property to, to take the property uh, of, well, people with property, especially people with a lot of property, rich, uh, industrialists like Cornelius Vanderbilt, right? Um, so that's sort of illustrative of how bad things had uh, had gotten. Uh, the idea that some groups were superior to others once based in racialized slavery now reappeared in a scientific guise as a means to explain the success and failure of individuals and entire social classes. Um, and this brings us to this idea of um, uh, the, uh, sorry, social Darwinism. So in 1859, 
the British scientist Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, in which he posited a theory of evolution in which plants and animals best able to adapt to their environment supplanted those less uh, adaptable. Different thinkers supplied Darwin's theory and used his language, simplified Darwin's theory, excuse me, and used his language of natural selection, quote unquote, the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest, um, to address social problems. And I should point out that Darwin, um, you know, Darwin's theory of natural selection, theory of evolution, theory of the survival of the fittest, um, you know, that's essentially scientific fact. Uh, but applying this to um, social conditions in the late 19th century, that was a bastardization essentially of, of Darwinian scientific theory. It wasn't meant to be applied in that way, right? Um, but people nonetheless um, took hold of those ideas and, and used them for their own sort of nefarious purposes, right? So according to um, this, this school of thought, which became known as social Darwinism, uh, evolution was a natural process in both nature, but also in society. Government could only corrupt society by regulating the society or economy to the advantage uh, of the poorer workers, um, who simply were unable uh, or, or less able to adapt to changing conditions. So these social Darwinists believed giant corporations had evolved to become dominant in the economy because they'd adapted better and to restrict their operations would be to reverse evolution, to reverse natural selection, to reverse progress. It was believed um, by these ad, uh, advocates, these proponents of social Darwinism, um, that those who lack property, those um, uh, on you know the short getting the short end of the stick, uh, the quote losers um, were losing um, because uh, lost sight of my note notes here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so they they believe basically that those on the sort of losing end of the situation were responsible for their own poverty. Um, and this was reflected in the fact that nearly all local governments, or nearly half of all local governments, offered essentially no poor relief, despite a burgeoning, exploding population of, of poor people uh, during this time. Poverty was believed was caused by essentially a lack of character, or absence of self-reliance, which is a long, uh, there's a long history of that idea uh, and this idea of, se you know, separating the deserving poor and the unde undeserving poor. Uh, there was a long history of that. Uh, worldview, uh, that belief in, in American society that contributed to uh, that belief really taking hold among a certain class of people in the late 19th century. Um, and yeah, thinkers such as Yale's uh, William Graham Sumner argued, for example, that no uh, no one in a free society can make a claim uh, for help from any other person, including through government assistance. Um, so... Yeah, this is uh, a picture of the iron workers at noon, called the iron workers at noontime. This was painted um, in 1880 by Thomas Anschutz, I think is how you say his name, uh, an artist born in West Virginia whose family owned iron factories. And what's notable about this, I think, is unlike artisans who depicted, uh, artists, excuse me, who depicted factories and workers earlier in the century, uh, Anschutz does not try to reconcile nature and industry. Um, so there's no um, reminders of the natural environment. This is very um, uh, artificial, industrial, uh, no sort of pastoral influences or aspects to this. Uh, nor does he emphasize the dignity of labor. Uh, the workers seem dwarfed by the factory um, and they really seem, you know, totally exhausted, right? Um, there's no real efforts to sort of dignify them. Okay, let's talk about negative freedom. So social Darwinism helped spread uh, a definition of freedom, limited government, a uh, negative definition of, uh, of freedom, live, uh, limited government, and unrestrained free markets, which became popular among business and professional classes in the late 19th century. Uh, the idea of liberty of contract, liberty of contract, was central to this definition of freedom. So the idea was that labor contracts reconciled freedom and authority in the workplace. Um, and as long as independent individuals freely, and this is important, freely contracted with each other, neither government nor a union had a right to interfere, interfere with working conditions. So that's the idea of a contract, basically. Uh, independent individuals, so a worker and an employer, are coming together and coming to an agreement, right, Um they're freely contracting with each other. There's no coercion. 
that's taking place, right? Then in that case, um, government didn't have the right and even unions didn't have a right according to this sort of contract ideology rooted in this idea of negative freedom. Governments uh, had no right and unions essentially uh, uh, had no right to interfere with working conditions, right? Um, interfere with the relations between capital and labor. Nor could Americans legitimately complain that they had lost any freedom uh, under this liberty of contract circumstance, right? Workers demand that liberty, um, sorry, that government enforce an eight-hour day or provide unemployment relief struck liberal, uh, liberals, uh, these proponents of liberty and con uh, liberty of contract and negative freedom, um, as a perversion of government authority that threaten liberty uh, for the worker and, of course, for the capitalist. So the old idea of free labor as a celebration of the independent small producer and a society of equality and harmony. Uh, became a defense, uh, you know, sort of morphed into, transform, uh, uh, transformed into a defense of the unrestrained capitalist market um, during this time. Uh, I should talk about the, the role the courts played in this, so especially the Supreme Court. So the courts played an important role uh, in making liberty of contract essential to ruling definitions of freedom. The 14th Amendment allowed the federal government to over, uh, overturn, excuse me, state laws that violated citizens' rights. Uh, citizens' rights. So by the 1880s, liberty of contract um, became the dominant interpretation of the 14th Amendment rather than equality before the law, regardless of race. So when the 14th Amendment was written, undoubtedly, I think most scholars would agree, uh, it's pretty clear that it related, for the most part, to equality before the law, regardless of race. Remember, that was one of the Reconstruction Era amendments, right? Um, the really, you know, one of the linchpins of the Reconstruction era itself, right? So it related to equality, uh, achieving, you know, um, the status of equality before the law for blacks, for for freedmen and women. Uh, however, that came to fall by the wayside and came to be uh, supplanted by a definition of the Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> Um, that essentially was rooted in freedom, uh, uh, freedom of contract, liberty of contract, right? Um, state and federal courts regularly struck down state laws that regulated business, right? Uh, on uh, on the basis of this idea of liberty of contract, um, such as uh, maximum hour laws. Um, and they held basically uh, that these laws were a legal interference with the rights of employers to use their property as they saw fit and the rights of employees to choose the conditions of their work. Uh, even though the Supreme Court initially accepted regulating uh, firms that represented a public interest, such as railroads, um, uh, this, the court uh, soon, um, really this is uh, more so in the early, uh, early 20th century, I should say, the court soon reversed itself, leading to the formation of the Interstate Commerce Commission, which was a good attempt um, to give workers sort of a place at the, the table here. Uh, but ultimately the Interstate Commerce Commission in many, uh, in, in most cases, you know, brought cases to the courts uh, and then lost uh, in the courts and, and in the Supreme Court. So the, the creation of this Interstate Commerce Commission ultimately didn't, um, uh, didn't do a whole lot for, for workers uh, and workers' rights. So the courts generally favored businesses whenever they complained of a loss of economic freedom. Um, they, uh, the courts also struck down laws granting workers rights, and they limited the reach of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, the most famous kind of iteration of this or example of this was Lochner v. New York, the Supreme Court case Lochner, Lochner v. New York in 1905. Uh, and in this case, the court struck down a state law. Um, New York state law establishing maximum hours for bakers, and the court, the court basically argued that it interfered with the rights of contract um, between uh, employers and employees. Okay, this is an interesting, so this is called Capital and Labor. This is actually a cotton textile uh, from around 1870, and this is meant to illustrate the ideal of free labor that's unfortunately being eroded. Um, but this is the the American ideal of free labor with an employer and employee shaking hands and laborers enjoying dignity at work in a happy home. One image you'll see on your left here. Let me zoom in. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. One image in its caption, it's called The Two Powers in Accord, illustrates the idea of a harmony of interest between worker and employer. So you can see it says the two powers in accord, and that's a worker and employer shaking hands, representing a harmony of interest. And, um, you know, a, quite obviously, the portrait of American industry here stands in stark contrast, unfortunately, of the widespread labor strife um, in, in the Gilded Age. <clears throat> 
that characterize the Golden Age. Okay, and the last section we're going to talk about uh, is labor and the Republic. Let's talk about labor uh, and some ideas about the you know the great labor question, <laughs> economic inequality, reform. Uh, how did ref and, and so kind of the central question here is how did reformers of the period approach the problem of an industrial society? I'll give you a second to to write that down. How did reformers of the period uh, approach the problem of an industrial society? So the overwhelming labor question, public debate in the late 19th century, more than any other point in American history, divided along class lines. The shift from debates over slavery and the status of formerly enslaved people to what uh, one politician called the overwhelming labor question was clear in 1877. Um, when Reconstruction ended and uh, the first national strike began, uh, this is the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, Rail, uh, railroad workers protested um, uh, in, in the strike, protesting pay, uh, pay cuts, paralyzed rail traffic in much of the country. Militia units tried to force them back to work, and after, tro after troops fired on strikers and killed 20 people uh, in, P in Pittsburgh, Workers rioted and burned property and strikes spread to other workplaces like Chicago and Chicago uh, and in St. Louis and in other uh, industrial cities. Um, so really all hell is broken loose, right, is how a lot of people saw the situation in 1877 uh, with this, this great railroad strike of 1877 and the reaction to it. Um, so the events really illustrated, they showed, they brought to bear a new solidarity among workers uh, and close ties between the Republican Party and a new class of industrialists. Um, and in the aftermath of this great railroad strike and, and the externalities, right, the violence and and um, uh, everything bad that was sort of associated with it. Uh, the federal government built armories in major cities actually to make troops, uh, to make sure troops would be on hand to help crush future uprisings. Um, so there was a new la a new wave of labor organizing actually in the 1880s and the Knights of Labor um, stood at the, uh, at its center. The Knights, uh, the Knights of Labor were the first labor group to organize unskilled workers as well as skilled uh, women and men and blacks as well as whites, although I, I should mention that uh, the Knights, um, uh, the version of the Knights of, Knights of Labor uh, on the West Coast um, excluded Asian immigrants from their, their union. So it's important to, to point that out. But the Knights in general envisioned at least and had some success, at least uh, success in a short term, on a short term basis, um, having a racially, uh, uh, in terms of race and gender, exclusive conception of unionization and solidarity, which was important, but unfortunately short lived. Um, in its peak year, 1886, the Knights, uh, Knights of Labor had around 800,000 members and involved millions of workers in strikes, boycotts, and political, social, and educa uh, educational activities. Labor reformers in this area presented a wide range of hopes and demands from anarchism uh, and socialism to the eight hour day and as a, a desire for uh, quote, uh, cooperative commonwealth. Um, they all agreed, uh, all of these, you know, so there's different demands, different ideologies that are under undergirding uh, the uh, these union activities under the guise of the Knights of Labor, strikes, boycotts, political, you know, social uh, activities and gatherings. Um, so these range from, uh, you know, the ideology of anarchism to socialism to the more practical sort of eight-hour day, uh, eight-hour workday demands, cooperative commonwealth. What they all agreed on was that these social condition, conditions of the 18 uh uh, uh, of uh, the late 19th century were highly unequal and required drastic change. Like this can't continue. That's what everybody agreed on. So the labor movement um, uh, challenged the prevailing definition of freedom uh, as freedom of contract and instead argued that Americans had lost control of the li their livelihoods uh, in their government during this time. So this is a depiction of a strike um, this is a painting in 1886 by Robert Culler, who had grown up in actually a working class family in Milwaukee. Uh, and here he depicts a confrontation between a factory owner uh, dressed in a silk, uh, silk top hat and angry workers. This is the ruins of a uh, the Pitts, uh, Pittsburgh Roundhouse. So this is a photograph in um, from July 1895. Um, uh, issue of Scribner's Magazine, and this basically shows the rides, widespread destruction of, pop, uh, of pro 
excuse me, this, this um, painting, or sorry, this photograph basically shows the widespread destruction of property during the Great Railroad Strike of July 1877. So pretty uh, astonishing. Ray, uh, Race and the Knights of Labor. This is an engraving from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. And this shows Black delegate Frank Farrell introducing Terrence uh, Powderly, leader of the Knights of Labor at the Labor Organization's National Convention in Richmond, Virginia in 1886. So as I mentioned a few uh, a few minutes ago, the Knights were among the few 19th century labor groups to uh, recruit Black members. So that's definitely significant. Let's talk about reform and Henry George. So workers were not the only ones. Uh, actually, let me just see where I'm at here. One second. Yeah, so workers were not the only ones dissatisfied with social conditions. A sense of alarm at social changes wrought by industrial capitalism spread through all classes during this time. So uh, social thinkers offered many different ideas and blueprints for change. And in, uh, at the end of the 19th century, an unprecedented number of utopian and, and uh, dystopian novels were published, including Caesar's Column by Ignatius Donnelly. Um, in which civilization was destroyed in a brutal war between uh, workers and businessmen. I guess you can put that in the dystopian category. Um, the most popular uh, books offered remedies um, for the une unequal distribution of wealth. Offering remedies for the un unequal distribution of wealth were uh, most especially Progress and Poverty, uh, which was a book published in 1879 by Henry George, The Cooperative Commonwealth uh, by Lawrence Grunland and Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards uh, from 1888. Uh, all three of these books um, made a splash. They were bestsellers and they spoke to the growing belief that American society was deeply flawed in you know, trying to identify the, the sources of, pro of the problems and identify changes, basically. Uh, let me talk about Progress and Poverty. Uh, by Henry George. So um, even though progress and poverty essentially had no direct influence on policy during this time, um, uh, it's um, it was a really important book nonetheless, right? Uh, it attracted more attention. Um, scholars think that uh, this book, Progress and Poverty, um, attracted uh, likely attracted more attention than any other book in economics in American history. Just think about that. Pro uh, po progress and Poverty, Henry George, published in the late 19th century, um, uh, uh, attracted more attention, uh, probably was read and, and discussed more than any other books in, a book in economics and in American history. So then uh, in the 1850s and 1860s, Henry George had witnessed the monopolization of land in California. His book suggested... Um, uh, the, the book he ended up writing, uh, Progress of Poverty, suggested that the major problem facing America was the growth of poverty alongside material progress. And its solution was the, quote, single tax, uh, which held that, um, which recommended replacing all other taxes with a tax on increasing uh, increases in land values. The single tax would be so high that it would prevent land spec uh, speculation in the city and countryside. Although not all embraced uh, George's solution, many people uh, were definitely stirred by his identification of the social problem. And let me talk a little bit more about his idea, you know, his book, Progress and Poverty, and his idea of the single um, single tax. So, yeah, basically, again, George in this, in this book um, sought to explain why poverty exists, notwithstanding you know, advances in technology and great concentrations of wealth and uh, in cities like New York City and, and San Francisco and Chicago. Um, so George really saw how technological progress and social advances, uh, including advances in education and public services, increased the value of land, natural resources, especially in um, uh, the value of land in urban locations, right? And thus the amount of wealth that can be demanded by the owners of the land from those who needed the use of land. In other words, uh, George thought the better the public services, the higher the rent is, as more people value that land. Um, the tendency of speculators to increase the price of land faster than wealth can be produced to pay um, has the result, according to George, of lowering the amount of wealth left over for labor to claim in wages, and finally leads to the collapse of enterprise uh, enterprises at the margin with a ripple effect that becomes uh, uh, bad for the economy as a whole, leading to business depressions, unemployment, foreclosures, etc. So basically in this book, George propose, uh, examines different proposed strategies for dealing with 
the problems of the late 19th century, but he finds them unsatisfactory. Um, he says that the only thing that's going to work is a single tax on land values. Um, uh, importantly, George defines land as all natural materials, forces, and opportunities uh, that are freely supplied by nature. That's how he defines land. He said um, his primary fiscal tool um, for leveling the playing field and de dealing with these problems essentially was a land value tax on the annual value of land held in private property. Uh, he argued that it had to be high enough to end other taxes, especially on labor and production. Um, and he thought it could provide a basic income uh, for the you know the the masses basically of uh of the population uh he argued that a land value tax would give landowners an incentive to use well-located land in a productive way this is important thereby increasing demand for labor and creating wealth uh this shift in bargaining balance between resource owners and laborers uh according to george would raise the general level of wages and ensure no one needs suffer poverty a land value tax would among other things also in urban sprawl tend farming, homelessness, and cultivation of low-value monoculture on high-value land. <clears throat> yeah, so this, uh, I wanted to bring this up. This is, um, I think, illustrative uh, just by virtue of the fact that this book got so much interest. These ideas got so much interest in the late 19th century. Um, and uh, he, George, even inspired a movement called Georgism, um, uh, uh, you know, proponents of basically this single tax, um, single tax idea. Uh, and the outside of the ideas themselves, the, uh, the fact that, um, so much attention was paid to this, I think really brings home the problems, you know, the severity of the problems of the, the, the economic problems and their effects on, on society and culture, on politics in the late 19th century and how desperate people were, um, for uh, for a solution, and I think this um, uh, this idea. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to think about this, but I think it's definitely an intriguing um, solution. That uh, it's an intriguing idea that I think um, uh, would be interesting if you applied this, you know, hypothetically to our problems, uh, our problems today, right? Um, so the cost of living in major cities, the cost of land in, in major cities, uh, you need workers in, um, uh, in big cities, but they have trouble pay paying rent in big cities, right? Um, so uh, this idea of a single tax um, is, is definitely interesting and has ramifications for the time period and perhaps even for our, you know, contemporary uh, context. Um, okay. So just wanted to spend a little more time on that. By the way, that's a picture of Henry George. <clears throat> this is the Great Labor Parade of September 1st. Um, this is from a newspaper in 1884. And this placard illustrates how the labor movement identified employers with the slave power of the pre-Civil War era. So if you zoom in here, you can see it says the past. Uh, it says slavery, the past, the present. Um, so in the past we had, you know, um, racialized slavery. Now we have sort of industrial, uh, uh, wage slavery under the guise of industrial, uh, capitalism, right? Uh, this says down with oppression, be honest, uh, sorry, by honest means we obtain our rights. So that gives you, gives you kind of an idea there. Okay. Quickly, I'll talk about the cooperative commonwealth. This was, um, this Book is significant because it popularized. Uh, this was the, the really um, the the book the first book to bring socialism to the United States. Um, uh, this kind of repackaged socialism um, and, and the cooperative commonwealth was by um, uh, a book written in 1884 by uh, Grenland, and this really brought socialism to American audience and American audience and repackaged it for an American audience, right? So socialism, by the way, it's the idea that private control of economic enterprises um, should be replaced by government ownership in order to uh, ensure a fair distribution of the benefits of wealth produced. I think that's a pretty good definition. Um, gov government ownership of the means of production. Um, and government supervision, central supervision over 
the means of production and distribution uh, and and consumption uh, as, a pro, as opposed to uh, those being owned by private uh, individuals and private corporations. Um, uh, that's that's socialism. And of course, socialism was a major political force in Western Europe in the late 19th century. Um, you have the uh, uprisings of 1848, for example, um, a couple decades before the era we're talking about, right? Um, so the uh, sort of revolution, short-lived revolution of 1848, uh, which, you know, Marx thought was this, you know, uh, socialist uprising, uh, and it, it fizzled out in, in many ways. Um, but socialist parties, of course, lived on in, in, in Western Europe and really all parts of Europe, um, for a long time after that, into the 19th, late 19th century and into the 20th century. Uh, but in the United States, of course, where private property was seen as essential to, uh, individual freedom, it was different, uh, different. Socialism was mostly confined to people, um, uh, Sorry, uh, socialism was mostly confined to immigrants, right, uh, whose foreign language writings reach few people. However, um, with the Cooperative Co Commonwealth by Grunland, uh, he brought these ideas, these socialist ideas to um, to America. And while well, Karl Marx had predicted that socialism would be achieved through a working class revolution, Grunland and co the Cooperative Commonwealth believed it would be achieved by peaceful evolution and thus made it seem more acceptable to middle class Americans terrified by, by the proliferating class conflict <laughs> and the prospects of a, a Marxist style full fledged social revolution. Okay. And that's Edward Bellamy. That's another important book to know that I'm uh, not going to talk about right now, but his book is Utopia. Um, I'll just say briefly that um, it promoted socialist ideas without using the term socialism. Um, and it proposed that the state guarantee economic security to all um, and, and actually inspired nationalist clubs and left a mark on social thinkers. So that's a little bit about Bellamy's Utopia, an, another important book from the time period. Um, and let's talk about Protestants and social reform. Really, um, Christianity also, different iterations of Christianity, the Christian lobby, Protestants, moral reformers, and advocates of the social gospel as well sought to reform things in the 19th century. Uh, and I'll, I think, end with this. What one historian calls the Christian lobby, quote unquote, promoted political solutions to what it saw as the moral problems raised by lab labor conflicts, the growth of cities, the scientific challenge of Darwinism, et cetera. Powerful organizations emerged in the late 19th century, including the Women's Christian uh, Temperance Union, the National Reform uh, Association, and Reform Bureau, which all attempted to, quote, Christianize the government in order to stamp out personal sin. Diverging from the past, Southern members called for federal regulation of personal behavior um, as well. These organizations achieved some notable goals, and their activism led to the Mann Act of 1910 and to, most famously, Prohibition. Um, the clergy also became a source of criticism of social Darwinism and uh, lazy fare, basically free market notions of freedom. While most Protestant pre preachers continued to attack individual sin, a new social gospel took shape during this time uh, in the writings of men like Walter Roshen, uh, uh, Roshenbush. Um, Rock and, uh, Rochenbush, I think is how you say that. Uh, a New York Baptist minister and Washington uh, Gladden, a, a congressional clergyman in Columbus, Ohio. Um, they argue that freedom and spiritual development required uh, an equalization of wealth and power, and that unregulated capitalism essentially degraded Christian brotherhood. Adherents tried to, uh, to minister to the needs of the urban poor, attack child labor, and promoted better working class housing and health and safety laws. Within uh, American Catholicism uh, as well, a group, of, uh, a group of priests and bishops emerged who had attempted uh, to alter the church's traditional hostility to movements for social reform and its isolation from contemporary uh, currents of social thought. Okay, so what I'm talking about there, uh, again, is basically this idea of a social gospel, uh, applying Christianity to um, identifying and solving the inequality, the social problems of the late 19th century. Okay, so yeah, I'm not going to talk, talk about the Haymarket Affair. Let's just, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the Haymarket Affair. I think let's go in there.
Uh, I think that's that's enough for this video. Um, so um, yeah, that's about it. Um, hopefully you uh, you were able to take some notes, uh, try and apply those details to the three you know essential questions that I laid out for the three different sections of this lecture. Um, uh, and you know, see if you can do that, especially as you you know within the context of going back and reviewing your notes. And of course, there's going to be uh, three questions. Uh, that relate to this um, uh, this lecture video on your reading slash lecture quiz. Okay, thanks for listening, guys, and I'll see you for the next video.